And welcome to everyone this morning. It's great to be together. And uh, if you love the person next to you, tell them right now you love them. Real quick. Just tell them I love you. Alright? It's good to be loved and it's good to love others. And a small verse this morning I want to encourage you with. Psalms 94 verse 22. It says, But the Lord is my defense. Can you say that? The Lord is my defense. Then it says, My God is the rock my refuge. Say that with me. My God is the rock of my refuge. As we process this morning and come together to worship Him, we're counting every blessing because of who He is. So let's stand together and let's sing to Him that simple song, Counting Every Blessing. Here we go. Chain breaker, here we go. If you've been walking the 
same old road for miles and miles. And you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're just trying to fill the same old walls inside, then there's a better life. Well, there's a better life. And if you got change, He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If we lost search for the night of day, the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out by the same old fire. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. Well, there's a better life, and there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. And if you feel all
our second Zoom call. And as we learn these new technologies, uh, we're, we're kind of learning as we go, but we have four missionaries up on the big screen. And then uh, we're still uh, have Brother uh, Henderson with us as well live here in the service. And this was just a really nice experience. Uh, the feedback I got, I was getting emails uh, from Brother Ivy as soon as the service was over. Uh, just what a blessing we have been to our missionaries as we're able to, you know, to make that connection with them. And, and hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll continue that on you know, through the week, you know, but really throughout the whole year. You know, we don't want to lose sight of the missions as we go forward. Um, everybody should have the faith promise card. Okay, remember, we, we gave out the memory verses. Uh, we gave out the missions book. Uh, but this is our last month. And our theme has been you know, think, pray, focus of the whole month has been, you know, really gearing up, preparing our hearts for that, and as the pastor was saying, this is our last week before we make our commitments to faith promise. So, one last week, you know, give, give the thought and prayer to see what the Lord will do for each one of us to make our individual contribution to the Great Commission to this faith promise program. As a reminder, we have t-shirts up on the end of the foyer uh, for a donation, and as a reminder, all the proceeds dollar of those of the sales of those shirts are going to two projects. Uh, one is our missionary friends to Cambodia, and we had a couple weeks ago, we got to see some of that one that's going on there. And then the other one is uh, the Bible distribution into the Middle East. Okay, so very two very important projects uh, that we're supporting there. And then uh, we've got two videos to show you from our missionaries. Uh, one you'll recognize, uh, Brother Rich from Scotland. Uh, it's not a repeat of the video, but he was with us a couple Wednesdays ago in the service. So you'll see his, his introduction and announcement to the church, and then also uh, lawmakers in the Philippines. And then followed by that, Brother Kenny's going to come up and uh, lead us with our memory verse. And then after Kenny, we have a special music uh, before we go back to the pastor for the rest of the service. So thank you, everybody. And our video is Hello, Pastor Lamb. Members, missionaries in the Philippines, our family has been on the field for almost 10 years now, and we're thankful to call it our home. We are on our second church plan, and Man of Eden program is a strong outreach of our church. As the world has been dealing with COVID, the Philippines has been on lockdown for 138 days. Children are unable to leave homes, along with the elderly and expecting mothers. There are military checkpoints controlling movements and taking temperatures. Strict measures are in place all over the region, and millions have lost their jobs. In the Philippines, there's no such thing as unemployment benefits to help sustain them. So a lost job not only affects an immediate family, but extended relatives as well, as grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, often live together and heavily rely on one or two of those breadwinners to put them all. So overnight, people experience an immediate helplessness. Many in our church were affected as well. Because of faithful supporters, we've been able to give love gifts to not only help with their family's needs, but also an extra love gift for them to pay it forward to their neighbors. Our church members have been able to give relief goods such as rice, sardines, ramen, eggs, formula, and diapers. And with this has come the opportunity of sharing the gospel. One man in our church, Carlo, was able to give food donations to his neighbor, Shirley, who works at a laundry mat in order to provide for her eight children. Carla was able to share the gospel with her, and she wants to attend our church when the lockdown is lifted. We're so thankful for personal seats that are being planted like this during this time in the giving of our church members. Even though they themselves are enduring these hardships, they've been blessed to be able to share the love of Christ with their neighbors. And we want to thank you for your faithful prayers and support for being an instrument in God's provision to these Filipinos. God bless you all. Friends of Hillsborough Bible Baptist Church. This is your missionary Rick Muller here in Scotland. Uh, I wanted to let you know how much of a big blessing you folks have been to us. I know you're facing the same challenges that we are uh, concerning this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Because Sherry and I could not have made it here uh, during this pandemic, if it had not been for the faithfulness of you folks there uh, in Hillsborough, Ohio. It's been difficult here. 
The Scottish government has been very strict in its lockdown policies. From the 23rd of March to the 18th of July, we've been in total lockdown. Uh, and then we could only keep in touch with our people during that time by Facebook and email. In fact, uh, during that time, we reached a lot of people around the world through the church's Facebook page. But as of July 18th, we've been able to meet again as a church. We're the only church within a 30-mile radius that's having live services at this time. Our people have been very faithful to come. We must all cleanse our hands before the church starts. They all have to wear masks during the whole service. Congregational singing is not permitted. Only 50 are permitted in the service, only 20 in a funeral, and 20 in a wedding. We have four people that are awaiting baptism, but the government is not allowing immersions at this time. Uh, they're still threats by the government for another complete and total lockdown. We're far from out of the woods yet. We still must wear masks everywhere we go and maintain a six-foot distance between us and all other people. We're not even permitted to go into anyone else's home. We can't even uh, go and visit our, our own members. No more than six people can meet uh, in the outdoors even at this time. We have a 10 p.m. curfew. But we keep on keeping on for our Lord. We take every opportunity that we've got uh, to get the gospel out and to pray uh, that hearts will be softened uh, during this pandemic. Unfortunately, most people here still believe that their only savior is science and medicine and that they can only beat this virus by watching out for each other. And that really means snitching on each other. Thank you for standing with us during this very challenging time. And thank you for your great burden for world missions. Together, we can still reach out to this terrified world with our glorious gospel message. Please pray with us that the Lord will give us the boldness to do what is true to his word and the wisdom to do it in the right time frame. You, dear friends, are such an incredible blessing, and I pray that God will bless you greatly and keep you very safe and honor you for your incredible love for us as your missionaries. Thank you so very much. Good morning, church. How's everybody on this beautiful Lord's Day? How many of you learned your memory verse? I can see I need to get up in the right cliff and uh, Alan, Terry, and Sean. We need to bring the mic up there and uh, get you all involved. As the missionary just said, that it's trying times. You know, here is a here is a memory verse that is so powerful. It starts off, all power is given unto me for the Lord. All power, think about that. All power is given unto me. It's the way the memory verse begins. Ed and Vicki Bayless were the ones, charter members that were going to lead you this morning, but Ed woke up with a, with a scratchy throat, so when you recruit people, they don't have time to get nervous. <laughs> So thank you, gang, for being here this morning and for helping us with our memory verse. Much appreciated. Who's going to start? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son.
Tim and Jackie Long, missionaries to Egypt, and uh, we lived in Egypt for 13 years. We went in the we went in January of 2002, and uh, after the revolution in Egypt, we stayed a couple of years, but then um, we were denied our visas, and so had to come back to the states. And we've been back to the states. States. We are on our second deputation. Uh, we enjoy deputation so much, we're doing it again. Um, but you know, there's things that are different this time about us going back and even um, deputation. Uh, the first thing is, um, the first time we went, we had three small kids with us. And our kids at that time, uh, when we went to the field, were 10, um, 12, 10, and 7. And uh, this time we're going back, it's just Tim and I. Uh, there's things we're enjoying about deputation with our kids. We can eat ice cream for dinner if we want. And uh, we do that quite often. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm looking, we're looking, we're both looking forward to this part of our life, um, going back and being in ministry. And, um, you know, having the kids with us in Egypt was a blessing, and we loved it. But there's things I can do this time around that I was not able to do before, travel with him more, and we're just looking forward to this. The second thing that's going to be a little different is uh, we're going to be working with refugees a lot more. We worked with Sudanese refugees the first time, um, but we do have churches there that we work with also, but even our churches have a burden for the refugees that have come into the country. And you'll see a little bit more of that in our video. Um, and then the third thing is we're going back this time much more prepared and experienced. Uh, the first time we went, we didn't know a single person in the country. We had talked to someone on the phone who had helped us get an apartment and things like that, but we didn't know anybody. And we didn't know the language. Um, I didn't know much about Islam. I didn't know much about Muslims. Um, but you know, God sent us there and God did a great work. And God put people in our lives that we have come to love, just like their family. And um, Philippians 1 6 says, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, God, if you're saved, God's begun a good work in you, and he's got more for you to do. Um, the work in Egypt, 
It's, it's a good work that God started, and he's got more there for them to do. He's got more there for us to do, and we can't wait to get back. And so we just ask for your prayers as we're on deputation. This whole year has been different for all of us. Um, it slowed us down a little bit, but it's nothing that God doesn't have, and God doesn't, you know, he knows what's going on. So thank you so much for having us. Well, as she said, things are a little bit different going back this time. We were blessed when we went to Egypt the first time. It was January of 2002, as Jackie said, but it was we were finishing deputation right as 9-11 hit. Uh, we weren't prepared for that at all. And some people, in fact, as we were finishing up, we were buying our plane tickets to go. Tickets were about $1,500 each. When I was looking at tickets the first of September, by the end of September, we got all of our tickets for $500 each. So about 2,500 total for our family. One of the things that happened though was we had a lot of churches there and you still going. In light of what's going on and in light of what could be ahead with wars in the Middle East. And we said, you know, God hasn't changed that at all. And we went and as we landed, one of the things we didn't know was God is really opening the doors for ministry there for us uh, through many different avenues. One of those was almost everybody we met would ask us, what are you doing here? Because they saw all these Westerners getting on planes and leaving. In light of that, we were able to tell them God had brought us there. That was his plan for many years before we arrived. And he hadn't changed that. And in that, we saw God also working alive with people just saying, you know, you must trust God if you're going to come here and bring your family and your kids. But God also opened up the door for us to be a part of a church, a small Baptist church that was struggling. I was sharing this with your pastor last night, and God brought us there at that time. And we know because now that church of about 30 or 40, it has its own national pastor. Uh, pastor Lanier has been there for about 17 years. They're running right at 300 people. And out of that church, we started two other churches. And they, they each have national pastors running around 175 to 200 in each of them and doing real well. God has been at work in a tremendous way. We, we, were, we were almost overwhelmed with the work that was going on. In fact, I implore any of you that are maybe considering missions, pray about Asia. Uh, we would go to churches that were considered underground churches. Our churches are above ground, they're legal, we have buildings uh, and everything, and we operate just like a church here would in many respects. However, there are underground churches, people meeting together that their church hasn't been legalized, they need a pastor. Uh, and one of those occasions we walked into, there was between three and 400 people meeting together and asking and begging, please send someone uh, to, to pastor this church and preach for us. And that's what you see going on in the Middle East. Now we have refugees coming into the country. Jackie said we worked with Sudanese refugees in the beginning. We, we didn't know this was going to happen, but God did. And that was uh, all of a sudden the Sudanese refugee ministry opened up to us. We didn't anticipate it. We were working with Egyptians and Egyptian churches. And in the midst of it, I met a Sudanese man and some other Sudanese and they had had their kids going to a school the United Nations had started. The United Nations pulled out and they said, you know, we need help. And so we encouraged our churches there in Egypt to, to reach out to help these refugees. And in the midst of it, God worked in a dynamic way. And I'll share that with you about one in particular, one man who was a Muslim. And this Muslim man, God is using him in a great way at this point. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But I want you to look at our, our video that we have. It's about three and a half minutes long, and it shares with you. Not only do we have Sudanese, now we have Palestinians, Syrians, Iraqis, Libyans. We have refugees by the millions from all over the world in our country. And the country's struggling. But what's fantastic about it is many are coming to Christ. And now the Egyptian government's trying to send most of them back to their home country. And our people in our churches are saying, what are we going to do? We have many young people that have grown up in the church that have given their lives to Jesus, and now they're saying, we want to serve 
and go start churches in those countries for these people. And we're excited about that. And that's what we're going back to at this point. So if you would, watch this video with us, and we'll get into the message here in a moment. Cairo is a city of over 20 million people. And when we went there, Jackie, of course, had come from a little town of Bodart, about 80 people maybe, if I counted the chickens and the cows. Anyway, and it was a different environment going into the country. One of the things that really spoke to her as a, as a mom with young children going in, and, uh, there's some nervousness there. We got off that plane. And the first day we were getting to go buy some things in some shops and purchase some items that we needed. And Jackie will even tell you up until that point, she was just like, really God, is this what you have for us? But an Egyptian lady approached her and in broken English asked her where she was from and asked her if she was from Sweden. She said, no. And she said, well, where are you from? And Jackie said, I'm from America. And this first Egyptian lady my wife ever spoke to turned around and asked my wife, do you have Jesus in your heart? Jack knew at that point God had left us alone and abandoned in the midst of things. 
We found that over and over and over again taking place in terms of always recognizing God was with us. During the revolution, it was evident that God was with us. One of the things that, as Ed said, happened was we encountered the refugee population, and we didn't know how to handle some of the situations that occurred in that, but every time we knew God was with us. As we go back this time, I have churches that will ask, what are you going to do when you get back? And, and really what we're praying for is just a mission explosion. And I mean that because we have people in our churches that are saying, now we want to start missions here and go out to other parts of the Middle East. And that's an exciting thing. Arabic speakers who are giving their lives to serve in some very hard, difficult places among people that have come to them in their own country but now being sent back. And them saying, how do we continue to reach these people? with the good news of Jesus Christ. And that should be on the forefront of what really our purpose is in this mission conference. How do we reach a lost and dying world for Jesus Christ? And I believe we can learn something this morning from the Old Testament. So if you would open your Bibles to 2 Kings. In 2 Kings chapter 7, I want us to learn a lesson in New Testament missions from Old Testament lepers. This morning, a lesson in New Testament missions from Old Testament lepers. Yes, this has been a challenging year, and in this year we have gone through things that are different, and people have asked, what are you going to do when you get there this time, and how is COVID going to affect things for you once you're there? And there's a lot of things I just cannot answer, but God knows. He has it under control. Because one thing I always noticed was that in the most difficult of circumstances, God was at his greatest. Amen. And he showed himself in control of all things. This morning, I want us to see that again in the lives of some Old Testament lepers in 2 Kings chapter 7. I'm just going to begin reading in verse number 3 here and read down to verse number 11. It says, and there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? And if we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. And if they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight, and they left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carry and thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. And came again and entered into another tent and carried things also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not dwell. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come and we that we may go and tell the king's Household. So they came and called into the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied in the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for the word uh, that teaches us so much today about missions and about sharing the good news that we have to a lost world. The world is dying. 
The world is in peril. Father, we live in uncertain times today. And I pray more than anything, maybe it's opening the eyes of people to see that life on this earth is temporary. Father, that they will open their eyes, their eyes up to an eternity that's awaiting. So that they reach out for the only hope that can be known, and that is in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let us be faithful carriers of that message to the lost. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that we encountered, as I said, when we went to Egypt was not so much hostility as it was questions of many people of what we were doing there. In light of the circumstances that were taking place in the world at the time, the thing they expected least was Americans, much less an American young family showing up on the doors of their country. And in that, it opened up the, the invitation really for us to be able to share the gospel and the hope to people that we never thought we'd have the chance to, to do until we actually got a good control of language. But, but really, it opened the doors for us to be able to communicate why we were there from the beginning, especially to people who spoke a little bit of English. Those questions arose, of course, out of the events of 9-11, and later on, they continued with the revolution. As we were there, the revolution occurred in January of 2011. It was something that was unexpected for us. We, we had not really seen this great air of spring explode yet, but it was starting. In fact, our daughter and our youngest, our son, had asked, can we go to the other side of town? And we have a friend that's going to be in a play, and we'd like to watch it. And of course, the events going on were not anything incredible or different other than what we already experienced. And we said, sure. Uh, just avoid downtown, because protests do tend to break out sometimes. Avoid that area, but you can go on across the city of 20 million people. That's how trusting we were. We, we weren't really fearful about our kids being out on their own. We would let them often go out on their own. Now, by the way, I mean, they weren't just little kids. They were upper teens. It's not like they were, they were eight and five, okay? So we weren't bad parents. We, we took into consideration they were older. But they went across town, and later on, about 1 o'clock, we started to notice, notice some differences that were occurring. The first thing was we, we lost communication with our cell phones. Uh, the towers were out, it seemed, you know, when you get no bars. That's what we had. It's like, okay, something's wrong. Both our phones aren't working. Maybe it's just a glitch with the cell phone service. And then all of a sudden, we noticed, no, the internet went out. We didn't even have internet service. It shut off. And it's like, something's going on. So we turned on the television. And we began to see what was taking place downtown. And that was really everything was falling apart and falling apart quickly. So a, a dad's first instinct is if you don't have a cell phone, you don't have Wi-Fi, you at least have a landline. Some of us don't know what that is anymore, right? But we still had landlines. I'm like, pick up the phone and it's dead. There's nothing there. It's just air. So we have no way to communicate. And as those TV stations begin to drop one by one until we were down to the one government station, they immediately announced that a curfew was being put in place immediately. And that no one was to be on the roads or in the street unless you wanted to be shot. And they said this will continue till 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. That was a, a hard time as a parent. The only thing really we could do was sit out on the balcony that night and pray as our kids weren't home and didn't come home through the evening. And pray, God, just take care of them. Show them where to go. We don't know where they are. And in the meantime, as parents, as that's going on, you're hearing gunfire. You're seeing buildings go up in flames. Police stations being attacked. We got up the next morning after praying that night. And when I say got up, we literally just got around and got our clothes on because we were up for the night. Got in our car to leave, and we noticed the streets were eerily silent. Quiet. And we turned around and we went all the way across this city trying to avoid any large groups as people were looting and taking anything they could. There were no police, no military on the streets anymore. 
And we pray, God, just show us where to go. We only knew one couple that lived on that other side of town, and we went there first, hoping they would be able to help us find our kids. And as we got there and arrived, we found that our kids were there as well as about 20 other kids that had taken refuge in this home. God had taken care of them. As I shared this morning, in the first hour, you can give us any amount of money, but it's the prayers that get us through during those times as missionaries. It was in the weeks after that we had to start protecting our own homes because the president had released over 40,000 prisoners, given them weapons, hoping they would create such chaos in the streets that people would beg for him to stay in power, which didn't happen. But in the meantime, these men would load up in vehicles and go neighborhood to neighborhood, and they would go basically into a huge apartment buildings. that's about all we have, going into home after home, looting and pillaging anything they could, carrying the weapons that had been given to them as they left the prison. It was a very serious matter for our neighborhoods, and we ended up taking cars at the end of the day. As the last call to prayer happened, nighttime ensued. We would park cars at the end of the streets to protect our neighborhoods, and we would go patrol. The areas, we would we'd walk around, we were told, bring any weapon you have. Now, weapons are outlawed in a country like Egypt, unless you're the police or military, or they, if they give them to the bad guys. And so we would carry our sticks and our kitchen knives with us down into our streets. And my 17-year-old son, who was with us at the time, he got to go with me, and he was my patrol partner. We were out one night as this was going on, and as it's dark, you've got your kitchen knife with you and your stick, and he goes, Dad, this is so cool. And I think, you are so stupid. <laughs> he said, what other teenage kid in America can say he got to patrol his neighborhood to protect them from bad guys in the middle of a revolution? I'm like, poor kid. He just don't but I say that because as we would come together in the evenings, all the men would meet together. There were many neighbors I had never met. And in the midst of it, again, many of them were saying, wait a minute, you're an American, aren't you? Yes, I am. Well, what are you doing here? You can get on a plane, you can get out, because I, that's what I would do. I said, God brought us here years ago. This is our home. And I say, God has carried us through many different things while we've been here in this country and even before that. And what I can tell you is God has got this. And I don't know why he's got us here at this time, but it's his will that we're here. And in light of all of that, I've got so many opportunities to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. That we didn't have to have the fear that others had. Because we knew of a certainty, the eternal hope that we had. It was the good news. Of the God. I say that because in the worst of circumstances, God gives us those opportunities. And I believe in America we have that today. Now let me get into the message. It's not going to be that long, but I do want to share with you the challenges of these lepers. These lepers here, they were having it pretty bad. Leprosy in and of itself was a pretty bad disease. And we see that from the New Testament more than anything in the New Testament. As Jesus encountered lepers, most people didn't want him to go near them. People tended to want to stay away from them. And we know from other historians that lepers were usually told they had to call out they were lepers as they entered a group so everybody would know they were the sick ones. <laughs> and in turn, many people would stone them or stick them back out in the way. They weren't welcome. These lepers here we find at the gate of the city, a city that had been under siege, a city that a foreign army had surrounded. And they're sitting at the gate, not welcome inside, not wanting to go much further outside. And as they are sitting there at this gate, they begin to recognize their condition. And their condition went far beyond just the disease of leprosy. They had a condition of being surrounded by an enemy army that was starving them to death. In fact, the previous chapter tells us people were so hungry within the city of Samaria 
they were paying very high prices for donkey head, for the, the dung of pigeons, and even cannibalizing their own children. That's how bad it was with them. And these lepers sit upon the threshold of the entrance gate going into the city, pondering their own condition. And their condition was clearly hopeless, it tells us here. Because as they sat there, they basically said, why are we sitting here till we die? I mean, death was pretty imminent just from the disease itself. Leprosy was a terrible disease because it literally ate through your body. It was something that you're, you lose those nerves within the body and literally could knock body parts off. Your body begins to rot and fall apart. Terrible disease. But yet, that wasn't the only part of their problem. They stood at the gate between the enemy and the starving city and they pondered their condition. And their condition meant certain death, no matter what. Leprosy, as I said, caused them to be alienated by their own community and society. They weren't able to have contact likely with family and friends directly. And their condition was hopeless. But you know what? Their condition isn't any different than any people around the world today that are apart from Jesus Christ. People are dying around us all over the world. And they're hopeless apart from the good news of Jesus Christ and the hope that can be found in him alone. In fact, in Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul made it very clear when he's speaking to that church at Ephesus that you have he quickened or given life who were dead in trespasses and sin. They were given life through that. But he says, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But he lets them know you've been given life through Jesus Christ. They had life. Their hopelessness had been given hope. But these men, as they sit here, they looked at their condition and how bad it was, and as I said, it's the same for the world we live in. We, we have a world around us that is steeped in fear right now due to COVID. People that are feeling very hopeless, very vulnerable. Great fear goes among the people. But yet they can have hope. As we have hope. Hope in the only Son of God. The second thing these men looked at, not just was their condition, Condition, but the consequence of their condition. The consequence of their condition did mean death, and it was certain. Because they sit there and they looked at it, and they said, These four lepers men were at the entering of the gate city, and they said to one another, Why sit we here till we die? The consequence of, of their lives where they were at was going to be death. They were either going to starve to death or die from leprosy or die from the enemy coming in. It was a hopeless situation, and that was the consequence. But again, it's no different than that of the sin within this world where we are told in Romans 3.23 that what? For all have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23 that what? The wages of sin is death. But what? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. People around us are facing the same consequences in terms of death, but it's not just a physical death that's being faced, it's a spiritual death. And these men, as they sit there, they look at their situation, they say, we are going to die. So why are we just sitting here doing nothing? They knew something had to be done. Then they realized they had a choice. They had a choice. Look at verse number four. I love the way these men put it, and the way it comes across to me is just there's a little bit of humor in it. Maybe it wasn't for them at the time, but verse number four says, if we say we will enter into the city, that city of Samaria where they were at, then the famine is in the city and we will die there. I mean, that was just, we can go in, but you know what? We're going to be dead. There's no hope there. And then they turn around and said, and if we sit still here, 
We do nothing, we're also going to die. Now, therefore, come, let us fall into the host of the Syrians. Let's go to the enemy camp. That's our best option. Go straight to the enemy. Why? Because they said, if we go out there, let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. I don't know about you, but you don't take those odds to Vegas, do you? We go in, we die. We sit here, we die. We go out there. We could live, but we'll probably die. I mean, that was pretty much the hope that they had. And they realized they had a choice to make. And I don't know about you, but within those choices that you have, what do you do? You go. And it couldn't have been easy for them because of these leprosy, of disease that they had, the leper sores on their body, the likelihood of their own body parts, some of them didn't fall in the often thing. I don't know about you, but it, it wouldn't have been that easy to have done, but yet you see these men recognizing their choice is clearly to go out. We have a choice to make. What are we going to do about it? The same could be said of us today when we look back even at Joshua's words, when Joshua was challenged in stepping into the shoes of Moses, he was fearful, he was nervous, but he knew he had to make a choice, and he challenged the children of Israel by saying, you need to choose you this day who you will serve. Why? Because as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We have those choices. I want to tell you something. There are people around this world, some of them, they don't have that option yet. <laughs> They're needing that option of hope. For them, most everything is death. Their system, religious system, is death. The life that they live within the country where they're at is death. The situation that they live in in terms economically is leading them straight to death. But they've not been given the message, the hope that's given to us through the good news of Jesus Christ. we got to give them that choice. And so now we need to be asking, who's going to go? Who will be the one to be there to give them that hope That's for them? It's that chance. The chance that many of us, we've taken for granted because we've grown up on that. Day. We've had it all around us in our country, on our TV stations, in our churches, around the world. But others, they've not had that. And it means somebody's got to go. Somebody's got to be there. Who will go to give them that choice? And then, out of that, being on the choice, you see that they make a commitment. And this commitment, by the way, in verse number 5, was courageous. It says, and they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. These men made a very courageous decision in stepping forward. Their commitment was courageous. They rose up and they realized we're going to the enemy camp, but it's the only hope we've got and we're going to follow it. And I say that because I want to challenge you. There's people around the world today, they just need to be given the choice so they can make that courageous step. It is hard for them. I mean, I can still say as a country, we've been very blessed. We've had a lot of freedom to be able to come, and I don't know what direction it's heading. None of us really do where things are going down the road, but up to this point in my life, we've had so many freedoms to be able to come to a house of worship and worship freely, to be able to send missionaries around the world, to carry that blue book <laughs> that we can travel so many places and go and take the good news. What freedoms we've had, how we've been blessed. May we never take that for granted. May we always recognize and be thankful for God for the opportunities that we've had. And I say that because we, we see these men here, they have to make a courageous decision. I've encountered people overseas as we've given them the good news and the hope and given the choice. They realize there's going to have to be some courage involved as they make the commitment. It's hard when you get to know people so well and love people and they love you back. And you're giving them the good news and you let them know, 
This is the only hope for you for eternity. And they say, I know. But if I make this choice, I know what happens to me. I know what my dad will do to me. My mom, my brothers, I know what happens. And yet we've still seen many of us say, I believe. I will choose to follow Jesus Christ. Knowing what's ahead for them. It's a tough commitment. And it takes courage to step forward. And we see that happen here of these Syrians. But it often happens around the world. There are people around us, they don't have just the luxury and freedom to change religions or to go to another religion without there being persecution or death that follows. May we pray for those people as they're given the choice that they'll be courageous to step forward and accept the hope that can be found in Jesus Christ. Because one thing we've always found in the midst of that is faith will take their trials and turn them into triumph. And that's what happened here with these men. These men, as they turned around and they went in, it says that they didn't hear a sound within the camp other than the fact that there were some horses and some donkeys and a little bit of noise going on in that, but no men rustling around or anything. Instead, the buffets were set. The food was laid out. You got silver and gold and raiment and everything. Wow! They have, they have really come to a winning side of things. They, they've received something great by making that step out. And it can't even begin to tell us the, the joy that can impact people's lives when they come to the hope in Jesus Christ. It's amazing to me how people will step out in faith and once they do the joy that just comes over them and then they want to turn around and take that and, and give it to others. It's because faith turns trials into triumph. And we need to understand that today that when we are reaching out to our neighbors, that when we reach out to them with the only hope and we reach out to them in love, they know that their difficulties, the many things that are taking place in their life, can become triumphs and victories through Jesus Christ. Faith also turns suffering into strength. And we see that these men here, they were probably in a state of suffering, but yet they had had the strength to go out to the camp, and as they go out and they discover what has taken place, they discover that victory has already been given. And by the way, that victory had not come through any efforts of the city of Samaria. It had not come through four lepers approaching a camp and everybody run off terrified. It had come strictly from God himself who had given the victory. And then we always recognize that in any victory that's given, that it's of God that he gives it. There have been times when we've been in Egypt that we've seen great things happen. And I just, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm Moses standing at the side of the Red Sea. I don't know if Moses, he puts that deal there in his mouth, probably drops wide open as that water spreads. But I felt there like my mouth was wide open as God gave some great victories while we were in Egypt. And I say that when, when we had one of our buildings completely destroyed. When the Muslim Brotherhood took over, these were the, the, the fundamentalists that took over after the revolution. And as they took over the country and they denied our visas later on, one of the things that happened on a Friday was they came over the walls of one of our churches in the south. And we heard through the news that this was taking place that over 80 churches were being attacked. And as our church in the south, in the Midian Bazaar, was being attacked, again, you try to reach them, but there's no phone service, no way to communicate, no Wi-Fi. They're shut off from the world because they don't want, the Egyptian government doesn't want the world to know what's going on. And these men, I found out two weeks later what actually had taken place. You see, my concern was for our pastor there because him and his wife and two young kids lived in the parsonage of the church. And when I hear they're attacking churches, my first thought goes to the fact, how are our people? I tried to communicate for weeks, only to finally get a reply from one of our young girls in our youth department through Messenger. She was 15 years old, 
Miriam wrote back to me. And she answered and told me exactly what had taken place. After the morning prayers of the Muslims, these men came to the gates and the, the walls of the church, and they came over the walls, and Pastor Amir and his wife and two kids had gone out the side gate, and a Muslim family behind the church had taken them in to secure them and take care of them while all this was going on. These men came over the walls, and when they came in, they began to throw all the things, the pews, as well as the Bibles, the song hymnals, everything we had out into the courtyard, and they set it ablaze. And then they turned around, and they weren't satisfied with that. They stole what they could out of Pastor Amir's home that they wanted, and then they brought in bulldozers and bulldozed everything to the ground and destroyed it. Miriam's response to me two weeks later was, Pastor, this is what happened. As she told me all of that, I was relieved to at least hear our pastor was okay, but she said, I want you to know, Pastor, we've lost everything. But the church is fine. You've always taught us that the people are the church. Yeah. And all of us are accounted for is fine. It taught me so much at that time that they, even in their suffering, could see the strength that was given to them by God. And God blessed through that. Because after the Muslim Brotherhood was thrown out later, the military come back into power. And they said, we don't like what's happened. And we want to make our relations with Christians in our country better and so they said, what can we do to rebuild your building, to restore your losses, and give you back what was taken from you? And they built our building. They actually built it three times larger than it was. <laughs> they gave us all that we had and it's all new. And it was at no expense to us at all. That's how God works. And our people learned to give God the glory in the midst of those difficulties because he's the one that gives the victory. He's the one that takes us through these difficulties. And in conclusion to this, you begin to see the miraculous happen. These men recognize the miraculous, and they begin to enjoy the blessings of it. It makes me think of our churches here in America. As I said, we've been blessed. We've lived in a time where we've been able to have nice buildings, freedom to come in and out, ability to have activities, to do things, to travel the world, to go on mission trips and things like that. But in the midst of it, we need to be careful that we're not hiding or hoarding some of those things for ourselves. Because I'm not just talking about financially. We have an opportunity to reach the world for Jesus yeah. Christ right now. More so than probably any other country in this world, as an American church, we have an opportunity to reach the world. It's our time, I guess you could say, in the spotlight to do that. England's had its time in other countries, but it's been given to us. Let us not waste it. And I say that because look at the lips of these men after they begin to hoard it for themselves. <laughs> they realized, and their words were quite simple in verse number 9. Then they said to one another, we do not well. This day is a day of what? Good hiding. Good news. And it's the same for us today. No matter how difficult we think things are and the circumstances all around us, today is a day of good times. Amen. A day to get the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. Even in the difficulties we face. Because they realized that now they had a message of hope to take back to that lost city of Samaria where they were eating their own kids. A time where they could go back and tell them the victory has been given to us. And if anything, it shows us the great mercy of a great God. Because these have been idol worshipers in the city of Samaria. But yet God still showed mercy. We have people around the world that we can say, wouldn't it just be better if they were just wiped off the face of the earth? But we have a merciful God. That he desires that the message go out. So what are we going to do? What will we do? As we stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, my question to you first and foremost is, is what is your personal condition today? As we stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we're going to have a verse or two of invitation here. What 
what will you do today? What's your personal condition? Maybe, maybe you need to reach out and hope to Jesus Christ, to know him as your Lord and Savior. If that's your personal condition today, let somebody meet you here at the altar to show you how you can know Jesus Christ. Maybe it's that you just do more missions this year than you've done before. That you know you've been holding.